Welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm David Ignatius, a columnist for the Washington Post. Today, we're pleased to invite you to a special conversation with renowned historian Walter Isaacson and the great biologist uh, Jennifer Doudna, who was the subject of Walter's new book uh, just out, The Code Breaker, Jennifer Doudna, Gene Editing and the Future of the Human Race. Uh, we're going to be talking about that book and its themes. Jennifer is a, a researcher at the University of California at Berkeley and won the 2020 Nobel Prize for her breakthrough science uh, in understanding uh, something called CRISPR that she's going to explain to us uh, and its role uh, in genetic engineering and all of our futures. So uh, to Walter and, and Jennifer, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Let's let's begin, uh, Jennifer, uh, with with you, and I want to ask you to start by explaining this uh, acronym CRISPR. Uh, that uh, is the name that we give to the technology that you help discover and explain to the world. Tell us what the acronym means. Tell us uh, what CRISPR does uh, in in life uh, and about uh, your breakthrough research. Well, thank you, David. The CRISPR acronym is very catchy. I think it's we're fortunate to have an acronym uh, anyone can remember, but it stands for clusters of inter of regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. Don't ask me to say that again. Uh, it's <laughs> a, it's a, what does it mean? Well, it's a it's actually a, a sequence of DNA that occurs repeatedly in bacteria that signifies a bacterial immune system, a way that bacteria can literally capture genetic information from viruses in real time and then use it to protect the cells from future viral infection. So this is a, you know, a phenomenon in biology that captured the attention of a few labs uh, starting about 20 years ago and eventually led to the uncovering of the molecular basis for the immune system that allowed it to be harnessed as a powerful tool from modifying the DNA in any type of cell. So Jennifer, t take us a step further and tell us how CRISPR, how this tool can be used uh, for treatment of disease and for unlocking basic riddles of life and science. It's a great tool for scientists because it gives all of us that are working with biological systems a way to manipulate the genetic material that tells cells what to do and tells organisms how to, how to behave and how to act. And, uh, and so this has been amazing as a technology for fundamental discovery. But beyond that, it also provides a tool that will allow real manipulation of disease-causing genes. And I think that's one of the ways that CRISPR is going to impact all of us in the coming years. It already is in clinical trials for some diseases. And I also want to mention that it's equally powerful as a tool for, man for manipulating the genetic material in plants. And so we have opportunities now in agriculture that were never available previously. We'll come back to some of the practical uses and, and potential misuses a, a bit later, but I want to turn to, to Walter and ask, uh, Walter, you've uh, famously written great uh, biographies of Leonardo da Vinci, uh, Albert Einstein, Steve Jobs, uh, great uh, minds who, who changed the course of our, of our civilization. Tell us how you came to write this book about, about Jennifer and why, why you chose her and what this book means to you in, in the larger project you've undertaken of explaining science. Well, first of all, I always like to look at creativity. Uh, I mean, you, David, and I, we both know that smart people are a dime a dozen and they don't usually amount to much. What really matters is being imaginative and being creative. So I like th to figure out the creative process. And I did it with, you know, physics but through Einstein. And that was the first half of the 20th century and the digital revolution, which was the second half of the 20th century. And then I became sort of fascinated about how we've entered a new life sciences revolution. And I was trying to figure out how to do a narrative story, a journey of discovery about CRISPR, about gene editing, and what it would do to our species. And uh, I met Jennifer Doudna four, five, six years ago, I can't remember, in Aspen at the Institute. And I realized that her life tale, from early on being fascinated by RNA, 
and then uh, doing seminal work on the structures of some RNA that shows how it could be the beginning of life on this planet, and then being the one with Emmanuel Charpentier who discovered how you turn CRISPR, which is RNA-guided uh, scissors, into a tool to edit genes. And then she took on the ethical and moral uh, uh, you know, questions that we have to address. And so to do a journey of discovery, it's useful to have a character who sort of is part of it all. So you can walk hand in hand uh, through the whole process. And the more I talked to her and the more I read about her, uh, it just, she was an inspiration to me as somebody that I hope other people will read about and say, hey, I want to be just like that. I want to love the beauties of nature and science. Walter, you write in your book that the subjects of these uh, extraordinary biographies, uh, Leonardo, uh, Einstein, Steve Jobs, grew up feeling alienated from their surroundings. And I, I want to ask you about um, that uh, comment that, that you made and the larger question of the wellsprings of this extraordinary level of creativity that you found uh, in in each subject, and then Jennifer, I want to turn to you and and ask you about about your own experience uh, as a scientist and person, and and your own sense of, of creativity. But but Walter, t t take on this question of the alienated person and why that's beneficial to to, end, to doing great work. Yeah, and I'm going to let Jennifer actually talk about how she was both an outsider and an insider at different times in her life. But I'll do it with Leonardo da Vinci, who, you know, is a small, young, you know, 14-year-old, leaves the village of Vinci to go to the city of Florence. And he's an outsider. He doesn't fit in. He's what Steve Jobs would call the round peg in the square hole, the misfits, the rebels. I mean, he was uh, born out of wedlock. He's left-handed. He's gay. He's distracted. And yet, that puts him on a mission to say, how do I fit in? How do I fit into you know this world? How do I fit into this cosmos? And I think there's a certain curiosity that comes. Steve Jobs being adopted and saying, okay, how do I fit in? And I think that basic curiosity of where do we fit into this cosmos is part of the quest that uh, Einstein has growing up Jewish in Germany in the 20s and 30s, or Leonardo or Steve Jobs. Uh, all of us are misfits in a little bit of ways. All of us feel like outsiders at times. And I think one has to use that as a way to be curious about the cosmos in which we find ourselves. It's well said. And I, I want to follow Walter's invitation and ask Jennifer to talk about the, the sense of it, at once being an outsider and an insider and how that may have propelled you in your work um, as you move toward this summit of achieve, achieving a Nobel Prize uh, discovery. Well, I was fascinated by Walter's perspective on this, and, and uh, I think he's right that when people are feeling like they're isolated or in some way excluded, they, some of them, you know, strive to, to be part of the, the bigger picture. And I think that that very d much does capture my own feelings growing up. I was in a, growing up in a small town, a beautiful place, Hilo, Hawaii, but uh, definitely felt like I was on a little tiny rock in, out in the Pacific, uh, which I was, and not really a part of the, the bigger world. And I felt in many ways like the world was, you know, passing us by. And I, not only that, but you know, my family moved to Hilo in the 1970s. And at that time, I was uh, in a pretty extreme racial minority in my school. I was a public school kid all the way through and had to deal with a lot of uh, anti, you know, anti, anti Caucasian, we were called Howleys, uh, you know, anti Howley feeling that I only later came to really understand and appreciate. But as a kid, I was just thrown into it. And I, you know, I looked different from most of the other kids. I was, I talked differently. Uh, my family was different. And I just felt, I felt very much like an outsider. And so for me, uh, in my escape, one of my escapes was to do a lot of reading, 
I hung out a lot in the library. I, 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 we, we, our town was very rainy, so many a rainy afternoon found me, you know, in my room reading books. And uh, fortunately, I had a literary father who was often uh, throwing interesting books my way. So that was one of the keys to my initial discovery about science and what could be possible in the laboratory. Jennifer, I, I've always sensed that with the really significant work, uh, it, it's often a case of pushing through the very dark time in the middle of the project when you just can't imagine it being completed, you can't imagine it working out. Does that uh, resonate with you? And maybe you could describe the, not reaching the summit, but the middle period in, in, in your life and career when you just had to keep pushing and believing in yourself, uh, maybe when other people didn't. I had quite a few of those, actually, David. I would say, uh, you know, starting in, in uh, probably in um, college when I, you know, wanted to be a chemist and a biochemist, struggled in some classes, wasn't sure I had it in me to, to you know, be successful in that field, questioned whether I should devote my life to this, and fortunately had mentors who encouraged me and said, you want to do it? You're excited about it? You're passionate? Keep going. And uh, somehow I did. And then many times during my research career so far, we've had bumps in the road, times when experiments weren't working, ideas weren't panning out, um, you know, grants were not funded, papers were rejected, all those sorts of things that happen in academic research. And I just had to find it, you know, kind of within myself in many times, you know, many times to keep going. And I, I do think that for me, it often does come back to thinking about my origins in Hawaii, my, you know, I had to have kind of an inner strength uh, many times to, to keep going there. And that does come back to help me out even now when I am struggling in my work. I want to ask you both to speak a little bit about uh, the role of women in, in science. Uh, Jennifer, you and your uh, co honoree are, are extraordinary examples of success. Uh, Walter, you write in this book, uh, the moving story of a woman named Rosalind Franklin, who didn't win the Nobel Prize um, uh, for discovering DNA uh, when James Watson and Francis Crick did, but reading your account, you wonder if she shouldn't have. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, her um, and, and what you learned from reporting uh, her story as a young researcher in London in the 50s about, about the role of women, the difficulties they faced then, uh, and the extent to which you think that's different now. She's a character in James Watson's The Double Helix, which is one of those books that Jennifer's father put on her bed one day. And I think Jennifer's noticed her in the book. She's treated a bit condescendingly or very condescendingly by James Watson, but also he respects her science. And she understands a key uh, a real key if you're trying to unlock the mysteries of nature, which is that the shape of a molecule, its structure, uh, is uh, a key to what it can do. And uh, so she's the person who does the images that help Watson and Crick do uh, the, uh, the structure of, of DNA. Uh, she couldn't win the Nobel Prize. It wasn't simply sexism. She had died of probably being uh, from the radiation uh, from all of her imaging. Uh, she got cancer, uh, so she didn't win the Nobel Prize. It would have been interesting had she still been alive, because I suspect they would have still given it to the three men, Watson, Crick, and Maurice Wilkins, who was uh, her colleague at King's College. Uh, and women have been written out of uh, the history of science far too much, whether it's Ada Lovelace being written out of the history of technology. But when Jennifer told me that story, it wasn't just the problem of women uh, not being written in the history of science, is that if you don't have role models, it doesn't occur to you as easily that, oh, women could become scientists. So it resonated with me when Jennifer told me, oh, that in sixth grade is when I realized that a woman could become a scientist. Nowadays, the life sciences revolution is more inclusive of women. In fact, 60% of uh, people studying biology in college or in graduate school, the women now. But uh, I don't want to change the subject here. I want to hear Jennifer talk about women. 
But there is a problem when I walk past the benches in various labs or in the conferences that there are no blacks almost. There are very few people of color or mi of minorities. And if we're going to start messing with the genome of the human race, I think that this biological revolution, we have to hope it's more inclusive than the tech revolution we've just been through. I want to ask Jennifer if, if she would just to stay with this issue of, of women in science for, for a moment. Uh, it's uh, one of the striking passages in Walter's book is describing some of the comments that were made uh, about Rosalind Franklin or physical appearance, uh, really kind of amazingly sexist comments uh, by her, her contemporaries in, in, the, in the 1950s. Wondering what your experience was as, as a woman uh, in science, whether you you faced that kind of really um, overt um, uh, uh, discrimination and sexism, and what your advice is to young women in science as they begin to make their careers and move forward. And then maybe finally you take on Walter's question about how uh, the life sciences can become more diverse and draw in more uh, people of color uh, to this amazing future that you're helping create. Well, my own experience has been, I, I would say, a bit more nuanced from what is described for Rosalind Franklin. I think, you know, in the decades since she did her work, there's been increasing inclusion of women, uh, more women now going to graduate school, uh, finishing their degrees, going on in professional careers in science, which is really exciting. It's still even, you know, that being said, it's still, I think, very challenging for women, especially at the higher levels professionally, whether in science or, or uh, biotechnology or other areas that involve uh, scientific uh, expertise. Why is this? Well, I think it's partly, um, in my experience at least, some of it at least is, is unintentional bias. Experiences that I've had have largely been, um, you know, the type of thing where I'm at a conference and the comments are made that are denigrating to women, but not to anyone in particular. It's more of a, a general comment that's made. And I don't think the commenter even is necessarily aware of how the comment might make uh, women in the audience feel about it. And I've, I've had that on, on a number of occasions. So I have always taken the approach, and I guess in terms of thinking about advice for, for younger women of, focusing primarily on the science and my excitement, my interest, and pursuing that where it took me. And, uh, and then only in a way secondarily thinking of myself as a female scientist. Maybe that sounds odd, but I, you know, I, I've always kind of taken the approach of wanting to be seen initially in my work, certainly, as a scientist. And then, oh, by the way, I happen to be a female scientist. And I think if you were to ask my colleague, Emmanuel Charpentier, with whom I've had a lot of discussions about, about this kind of thing, I think she would, she would say a very similar, a similar, similar thing. And let me ask you, Jennifer, about this uh, larger question, additional question of, of, of greater inclusivity in the life sciences, uh, more people of color at those lab benches as Walter formed the image. Incredibly important. I can't. I can't emphasize it enough. I, I have to point out that you know the whole, my whole experience with CRISPR has been one of really interesting international diversity. So we've had you know our our own uh, CRISPR collaboration with Emmanuel was a highly uh, international team. And if you read Walter's book, he points out that many of the scientists, other scientists working on CRISPR are not in the US, they're, they're located around the world. They're of different uh, cultural backgrounds. And I think that is one of the aspects of the story that's A, very interesting, and B, has really led to the richness of the science. Because of course, when people come to it with different perspectives, they bring different ways of looking at, at a problem and, and conducting experiments and interpreting results. So more diversity in science is highly desirable, and the challenge is always how to achieve it. Um, I, I don't have a simple answer, but I do think that anything that we can do collectively to encourage younger students especially to pursue science, maybe students coming from uh, groups that have been traditionally not part of professional, the professional science world, 
is uh, is something that we should be putting money into and, and time and effort. Jennifer, I want to ask you to uh, speak about the practical applications of the CRISPR technology that you won your Nobel Prize for, in in particular in dealing with the pandemic that we've been living through this this last year. Tell us some of the ways in which CRISPR can be useful and relevant in dealing with the coronavirus or, or future pandemics, uh, the role in creating the kinds of, of medicines and therapies that we'll need. Well, CRISPR in its natural format is an immune system, and its job is to look for viral genetic material and call it out and destroy it. So I think it's a very interesting opportunity to take a system like that and actually use it to address the current pandemic. And we're not alone in this, of course. There are many, many laboratories, both in academia and in companies, that have been working on this, looking at ways to use CRISPR in particular as a diagnostic method. So this is something that uh, you know I feel personally very excited about. I think it's a it's an opportunity to not only address the current pandemic with diagnostic tests that will be rapid and we hope uh, a format that can be run in a point of care setting, but also um, a way to prepare for future pandemics because fundamentally the CRISPR technology is programmable. So it can be programmed to recognize the, the coronavirus that causes COVID-19, but it could also be programmed to recognize influenza or a host of other pathogens that might be encountered in the future. And just so that our, our audience understands this, it, it can be programmed to recognize that them for purposes of, of testing and also for, for therapeutic purposes uh, as, as a follow-on? Therapeutics are harder, I feel, because they're, um, yeah, although in principle, CRISPR could be used that way. In fact, of course, it does operate that way in bacteria. If we wanted to use it in a clinical setting as a therapy, we'd have to figure out how to get the CRISPR molecules into all the infected cells in an individual uh, tall order. So my own feeling has been that at least for the current pandemic, that's probably a bit too far off and it's better to focus on using it as a diagnostic, which I think is a, an achievable goal in a timeline that makes sense for the current pandemic. So I wanna ask both of you, starting with Walter, to talk a little bit about some of the scary issues uh, in, in terms of, of bioethics that are at the frontiers of this technology. Maybe a good place to begin is by talking about the CRISPR babies that were born in China in 2018, uh, Nana and Lulu. Uh, Walter, do you want to just tell us what happened in that experimentation and why it sure. made scientists so nervous? Yeah, it was a young Chinese scientist who had been some, to some of the CRISPR seminars, including ones where Jennifer was. And he decides he's going to make a big name for himself by being the first person to make designer babies on this planet. And so he edits the early stage embryos that would turn out to be two twin girls so that they don't have the receptor that for HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. This was scientifically unsafe. It was premature. We don't know about unintended consequences, the off target things. But there's something even deeper, which is even if it had been safe, are we really ready to make inheritable edits? Because by doing it in early stage embryos, it meant not only did those twins uh, be edited, but all of the cells in their body in theory, including their reproductive cells, so it would go down to their children and all of their descendants. And that's a line that's difficult to cross. Now, in some ways, maybe the coronavirus is saying, wait a minute, we could edit receptors out of the human race that uh, are for really bad, dangerous viruses. Explain to me, what's the moral problem with that? In fact, maybe it would be immoral not to do that. So I think we have to keep an open mind that 10, 20 years from now, when it's safe, we have to say, do we want to cross that line? However, I don't think we want to cross that line now. Jennifer was not only kind of knew this guy in passing, but when he was about to make his announcement, she heard about it, got an email, and she flew to Hong Kong where there was a summit on this issue and convinced him to talk about it. 
So I think that's gotten us all thinking about, do we want to make inheritable edits to the human race? Jennifer, let, let me ask you to talk about this slippery slope, if you will. And I'm going to quote something that, that Walter wrote. This was in the Wall Street Journal, but similar passages in his, in his book. Walter writes, should, should we alter our species to make humanity less susceptible to deadly diseases? That seems like a wonderful boon, especially during the pa pandemic. What about getting rid of deafness or blindness or being short or, or depressed? And then you go down the list of all the, the things that you might begin to edit. As you think about these really enormous uh, questions of, of bioethics, tell us about your basic framework uh, as you come at, come at the questions. For me, you know, I'm, I'm, I've always done very fundamental science. And so one of the, I guess, great reckonings that I had to face with CRISPR was the, you know, the realization early on with the technology that it gave scientists this fundamental ability not only to manipulate genes in cells or, or, uh, or organisms that were fully developed, but also, as Walter just said, to introduce changes to DNA that would become inherited. And that really, um, in, in, in humans, of course, that really is a, a profound thing to think about, you know, both positive and, and, and I think negative. And so I've been grappling with this topic for the last several years. We organized the first conference on this subject back in early 2015, right ahead of the publication of the first uh, scientific papers on manipulation of human embryos. And, um, and as we just discussed, this then in a way culminated in 2018 with the announcement in Hong Kong of the work that was done in China. And so I, I think the, the outcome of this has been, um, you know, for me personally, certainly a, a real reckoning, you know, thinking about, you know, the implications of germline editing in humans. I was initially very opposed to it personally, thinking this is just not something that should be done. But over time, I've come to realize that, you know, there may be time, may be opportunities, especially in the future, where it would be unethical not to do that kind of manipulation if the technology is safe and effective for um, avoiding certain kinds of diseases. So I maintain an open mind, but I do feel cautious about it. And I think it's critical that we have an open, transparent discussion internationally about the topic as has been occurring. Walter, we have just two minutes left, and I'm going to ask, ask you to, to close out our, our conversation by addressing something that's very much in the news uh, these days, and that is the, the increasing competition between the United States and China at the basic frontiers of science and technology. One striking thing about the Biden administration is it's decided to compete head on with China in the life sciences, in, in quantum computing, in AI. Tell us briefly what your thoughts are about the good sense here in, comp in competing and the dangers of politicization of science. Well, as Jennifer knows from the book, uh, both she and I think competition can be a good thing. It can spur people on. The Chinese are somewhat ahead of us when it comes to using CRISPR and gene editing for cancer treatments, for example. But China is on our wavelength. When that Chinese doctor did inheritable gene edits, he was then put on trial and is now in jail. So I think your friend and ours, Tony Blinken, who's just meeting in Alaska now with the Chinese foreign minister, they're gonna make a menu of where we have rivalries, where we have competition, but they're also gonna say, where are there places we should cooperate? And I would put atop that list science, and especially the life sciences, which is to be able to use both gene editing technology and for that matter, messenger RNA vaccine technology and say, let's see if we can work together there. Because as you remember, and you've written about even during the Cold War with Russia, uh, when we were competing on a lot of levels, there was a scientific cooperation that uh, sapped some of the poison from the competition. And I would hope the Biden administration, as you know, 
Uh, Joe Biden has been uh, with a moonshot against cancer. He's been very interested in science. He's got great people there uh, and people like Jeff Zions who have taken the charge against the coronavirus. I suspect that Tony Blinken, who also likes science, could say, let's see if we can use this with China, not as a struggle that's uh, to comp compete, but as a way we could cooperate. I want to thank uh, both of you, a uh, brilliant scientist in Jennifer Doudna, a great uh, biographer, uh, Walter Isaacson, who's, who's told her story. Thank you both for joining us in this conversation. It was great to have you both. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Thank you, Janice. So uh, we'll be back with Washington Post Live on Monday uh, with our regular series on the path forward. I'll, I'll be speaking with Gary Kelly, who's the G CEO, chairman of the board of Southwest Airlines. Uh, please join us on Monday. Thanks uh, for watching.